Now we start talking about interference. And we've actually touched a little bit on interference last semester when we talked about mechanical waves, but we're going to talk about it now in particular for electromagnetic waves. All right. So um, when we talked about mechanical waves, one of the examples that we went over was waves in a ripple tank, so water waves. So here you can see waves generated by a plunger just going up and down in a tank of water. And what you can see is that when you have two sources, that they will actually interfere. So that if you looked at the amplitude at some point along here, you would look, you would see minima and maxima um, as a function of position. All right, so now we are going to talk about the double slit experiment, which is where you take two narrow slits and you shine light through it. We're going to talk about monochromatic light. Um, a fun fact, a lot of these experiments were kind of tricky to do until we had lasers because the light has to be, co it, well, the light, light usually, it, the effects are stronger if you have coherent light. Um, so then when you have light shining through a, a double slit experiment, so you take some monochromatic, meaning a single wavelength of light, and you shine, um, you shine it on a double slit, then it acts as if you have two sources, well, two line sources of light, and then the light travels to the, the screen, and you will see an interference pattern on that screen. Um, so you see constructive interference. This shows, for example, amplitude of a wave is a function of position, and you're going to add one wave to another wave. And when you do that, if the two waves are in phase, so they have maxima and minima at the same place, the resulting wave is going to have um, it is going to have the same shape, but the amplitude is going to be larger. This is, in this case, these two waves are perfectly in phase, so the result is just, and the two waves have the same amplitude, so the result is the, has the same phase as the individual waves, and it has twice the amplitude. So that we call this constructive interference. You can also end up with, uh, you can also add waves where they are exact, where they are out of phase, and this shows waves that are exactly out of phase. So this wave has a peak where this wave has a trough. And when you add that up, you get zero. So they have the same amplitude. And they will exactly, so therefore, they will exactly cancel out. Now, of course, when you talk about interference, you can have everything in between. So you don't necessarily get exactly, uh, you don't necessarily get total constructive interference. And you don't get total destructive interference either. Um, so you can get everything in between, and if you had something in between, you'd be left with a wave with much lower, much, with lower than twice the amplitude here, and greater than zero, but something in between. All right, so we're going to use this, and we're going to talk about what happens in the double slit experiment. When you're thinking about what happens, you can think about this as a plane wave impending upon a double slit. Um, and uh, here you can imagine the slit extending uh, infinitely and the wave extending infinitely. So I've got, I am a plane wave traveling through the, switch, the slit. I've got, uh, I'm moving, all of the light is moving in phase with each other. And then when it hits the slit, light can only go travel through the two slits. So these two slits act like point sources from the slit when we look at the projection onto one dimension. And then <clears throat> we see this inter you know, the two source sources interfere with each other. And then over here on, this, uh, on the screen, you will actually see an interference pattern. So we're going to talk about what you would see in that interference pattern. Um, now, we're going to use, we're going to start with the ray picture of, the, of light. So here I have an array traveling from he point here to a point from the source to the, from the slit to the point on the screen. Um, and they're going to start in phase, but because there is a slight path difference, so in this case, the path traveled by light from so the slit number two, it travels slightly longer than slight light traveling from slit number one. So you're going to, you have a potential for constructive or destructive interference. So we're going to zoom in on this. And we actually make an approximation. We are going to make the approximation that the screen is very far from the source as compared to the, um, the separation between the slits. 
So rather than assuming here the slit is the sources are close, um, and then if we move the um, we move the screen very very far away. Remember, we're talking about uh, light waves, and to get this effect, we have to have a slit on the order of the wavelength of light, so on the order of uh, 10 to the negative 7th uh, meters, or something on the order of micrometers. These are really small slits. Sometimes you can actually see them, but they're still fairly small. Um, and so if you have a, a slit that's on the order of a micrometer and you have your screen a meter away, it's a pretty good approximation that the screen is far away. Now, when we have a screen which is far away, the two light rays are approximately parallel. And when we do this, we can draw a projection. That, so if these two light rays are parallel, then, and they both are traveling to the same screen, then the path length difference is this right here. Um, and so there's this angle theta. Um, theta is the angle that the light ray makes with the, um, that the light ray makes with the, the screen. Now, of course, if you go all the way out to the, the screen, this separation is on the order of micrometers. So that you're not going to be, the screen is large compared to this separation. So you, effectively, the two light rays, you don't have to worry about the difference between this path length and that path length. That's what it means to approximate these two rays as parallel. All right, and then if, then we can draw this triangle, and this triangle, this is the, hypot the, the hypotenuse is D, and we are after this length, um, and that length is simply going to be D sine theta. So um, we will get maxima and minima every time D sine theta is equal to um, an integer number of wavelengths. So it's D sine theta equals M lambda, where M is equal to 0, 1, 2, and so on. Now, in this approximation that the screen is far away, that angle theta is, so if, there, if the screen is far away, if this separation between the slits is very small compared to the distance to the screen, then this angle theta is the angle between the point P, where you're looking on the screen, and the center right in front of the slits. So when both light rays travel to the same point, if they travel here, then they are both they are in phase. So then you're going to see a maximum right there, because where this is the amplitude of the light um, so you will see a central maximum there, and then every time you trap, every time the angle increases, so d sine theta equals m lambda, then you are going to get another maximum. And it, oh, and actually, I should say these are can be positive or negative, so you're going to have a symmetric pattern about the center. Now we didn't. Let me talk about what would happen if we didn't assume that these two light rays were parallel. What you would have is that you would, you would have to consider the spherical, um, uh, you would have to consider the spherical nature of the wave itself. So if I go back to our picture of water waves, if you were here, now here, the two sources are not far apart compared to the distance to the screen. So you're still going to see qualitatively the same effect, that along this central line, you have a maximum amplitude because the, way, the distance that the light travels from both sources to that point P 
is the same. So they're going to interfere constructively. You're going to have maxima there. And then there's going to be certain angles where the two waves interfere destructively and you get no amplitude. What's different is that you will have you would have to consider the ex you would have to consider the geometry a little bit more carefully because the path length difference is not exactly um, is not exactly as this d sine th theta. Okay, so then we have our two maxima, and we can look at what happens on this screen. So here you see the, this is the amplitude. You can actually, if you take an upper division optics class, you will go over how to calculate the amplitude exactly. We are not going to do that in this class. Um, but you see that you have a central maximum. This is the brightest point because the, um, it's easiest for the light to travel to the central maximum. And then you see these fringes, so that if you look at what you would see, so remember here, we're looking at the screen like this, and now I'm going to turn that screen so that you can see what it looks like on the screen, and it looks like this. You have a central maximum, and then you have these other, we call them fringes. And often what you can directly measure is not the angle of the fringes, but you can measure the height of the fringes relative to the central maximum. So we're going to use the small angle approximation. Now, at this point in your uh, education, you should have had at least one semester of calculus in its entirety. So I'm going to assume that you have seen, um, that you have seen uh, um, a Taylor series. I'm going to cover the Taylor series in a little bit more detail. So a Taylor series is when you approximate a function as the sum of different constants times a polynomial. So a Taylor, for a Taylor series, you take the nth derivative. If I'm trying to describe f of x, f of x is equal to the nth derivative as a fun uh, the nth derivative of the function evaluated at the point you're expanding about x naught times x minus x naught to the power of n from n equals zero to infinity. The Taylor series is defined when you have a nice, neat, smooth function with uh, where the derivatives are all defined. For some functions, the Taylor series does not converge, meaning that it isn't that you cannot make um, you cannot easily make an assumption about uh, what a function looks like from its Taylor series. You would need all if you truly add up to infinity, you would get the function, but you can't really um, you can never really add up to infinity. But for most of the functions that we work with in physics. Um, they meet the conditions that we need for a Taylor series to be defined and to converge in that they are nice and neat. They, they, have smooth, they are smooth. They have derivatives which are defined and, um, and continuous. And the functions tend to converge nicely. So most of the things that mathematicians worry about with derivatives and with Taylor series, we don't have to worry about for our, um, it, we don't usually have to worry about in physics. Because we always, we tend to work with the functions that behave nicely. There are some exceptions to that, but not in intro physics. All right, so now I'm going to look at this function, sine of theta, and I'm going to look at its Taylor series. And I'm going over this in a little bit more detail because this is something that you're going to see in physics an awful lot. So if f of x is equal to sine of theta, then f, we're going to expand about 0, f of 0 is equal to 0. At the first derivative of x is equal to cosine of x. Here in my head, I was doing a mental check of whether it's positive or negative uh, cosine, but if 
but I always go back to the picture of sine. Sine starts at zero, so its derivative has to be positive. So I want the positive cosine. After all these years, I still have to do that cross check because it isn't in my brain anymore, whether it's uh, positive or negative. All right. Then in this case, the first derivative evaluated at zero is equal to one. F double prime of x, the second derivative is negative sine theta. So the second derivative evaluated at zero is equal to zero. The third derivative is negative cosine theta. Uh, I've switched variables here. I've defined it in terms of theta, so actually I need to change all of my x's here to thetas. This is where when I'm teaching in person, I give my students uh, candy if they catch me making a mistake, because I tend to make careless mistakes. All right, the third derivative of zero, uh, uh, the third derivative of the function evaluated at zero is then negative one. And what you will see is that the fourth derivative evaluated at zero equals the sixth derivative out evaluated at zero equals zero and so on for all of the even derivatives. And every other odd derivative is going to be one and every other, even, every other odd derivative is going to be negative one. So I can write that sine of theta, oh, I forgot one important thing here, n factorial, the, n, the, the um, order of the derivative. All right, so sine of theta is equal to 0 over 0 factorial, which is equal to 1, times x to the 0, so this term is 0, plus the first derivative over 1 factorial times x to the 1 minus, or well, set, let's see, the next term is plus 0 over 2 factorial x squared minus 1 over 3 factorial x cubed, and then I'm going to continue. So I'm going to see that all of the even terms go to 0. So my next term is a positive x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus x to the seventh over 7 factorial. And I can continue this on. And I can rewrite this as negative 1 to the n x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial from n equals 0 to infinity. So if I look at n equals 0, I get negative 1 to the 0 is 1, x to the 1 over 1 factorial. n equals 2 gives me negative 1, or sorry, n equals 1 gives me negative 1 to the n, so a negative 1, x to the 3 over 3 factorial n equals 2 gives me negative 1 squared, which is 1, x to the 5 over 5 factorial, and so on. Okay, what do I do with this information? Well, I am a physicist. A good physicist is a lazy physicist. I want to, I'm looking for a shortcut. So, here, we have already said 
The screen is far away from the source. And now we're going to look at the, um, what's going on here. I want to know the heights of those fringes. If the screen is far away from the source, I can often make the assumption that this angle is small. If this angle is small, then this, this term with x to the 3 is much, much smaller than that term. So I can make the approximation that, uh, uh, and I switched between x and theta again. And so here I'm going to have to go back and correct all of my x's, and I'm going to make them thetas. Sometimes it is useful to have students in person because students would correct me. All right. My students would have caught that and asked me what on earth I was doing. All right, so I can make the approximation when theta is small that sine theta is approximately equal to theta. If I wanted to be a little bit more precise, I could add a theta cubed over 6 term. This is called the small angle approximation. We actually saw it last semester when we were talking about the motion of a pendulum, and we approximated sine of theta as theta. Um, and all it is, when I first saw this in undergrad, is like small appro angle approximation. How on earth would I have known to do that? But that's why I'm showing you. It is a Taylor series. Uh, often in physics, when you don't know how to solve something exactly, you take a Taylor series and drop everything except the first term. If you want to get a little fancy, if you need something slightly more accurate, you use the, se the second non-zero term. The small angle approximation is good to about 10% until you hit about 10 degrees. By the time that you're about that you have an angle of about 10 degrees, those corrections start getting larger and larger. So what we're going to use for this problem is the small angle approximation. All right, so we have done the small angle approximation. I have shown you that sine theta is approximately equal to theta. And I'm going to make another approx I'm going to make another small angle approximation. I will leave this as an exercise for the student to show that the tangent of theta is approximately equal to theta as well. Um, why am I leaving this as an exercise to the student? Because when you have the tangent, you have much uglier derivatives. You have to consider the cosecant squared term, and then you have the you have to consider the chain rule. It's a lot uglier, but the or you can look it up in uh, um, in an integral table. So if I have sine theta is equal to theta, tan theta is equal to theta, I can say sine theta at small angles is approximately equal to tan theta, and then the tangent of theta here is y, the height of the the height of the slit from the center over d. So d is the separation between the screen, the slits, and the screen. Here I'm using capital D. I'm following the book's notation. Not that I think it's great to have a problem where you have a capital D and a lowercase d, but better to stick with the book. So then I can rewrite this equation and say that the slits, the mth mth slit is at dym over d, and that is equal to m lambda. So y sub m equals lambda, let me put it as lambda capital D over little d times some integer m. All right, now let's choose, let's see what size these are. Let's choose light that has a wavelength of 600 nanometers. And I will choose a capital D 
of one meter. The screen's about a meter away. A little d, d a slit separation of one micrometer. And let's see how far apart, the, well, first of all, here you see this is taking some constant and multiplying it by an integer. So each of these different fringes, they're roughly equally spaced. Now, in angle, they're, the sine theta is equally spaced. But then when you would have, if you would calculate the exact angle, you would find that the positions were not exactly equally spaced. But if your screen is far away, then those slits, th those fringes are in fact roughly equally spaced. So let's look at what those are. Um, so I have 6 times 10 to the negative 7th meters times 1 meter divided by 10 to the negative 6. I see there's got to be a meter there. And then this is different from my integer, which is also called lowercase m. And my slits are, I get this 6 cancels out most of that 7, and I am left with 0.6 times m. That's actually a rather large separation. So my, if I have a 1 micrometer slit, then those maxima are a little more than half a meter apart if I use light with a wavelength of 600 nanometers. If I have a, a slightly, um, if I want to make, if I decrease that separation, sorry, if I increase that separation between the slits, then this becomes smaller. Often in the experiments that you're doing in the lab, your separations will end up being on the order of centimeters. Now, what we, I want to just make a, ah, Sorry, this is the double slit. So you will do the double slit experiment in the lab, and you will probably look at things that have separations on the order of tens of nanometers, which will give you separations on the order of centimeters. You can sometimes, well, you can almost always, we didn't have to make the small angle approximation, because in a lab, you can calculate the actual angle, but if you calculate the actual angle there, it's a little bit more work plugging in the trig functions. All right, so then we can talk about what happens when you add more slits. Um, so here, this is the same geometry, but we have simply added an extra ray. Now, if we're still talking about the, the, easy, the easy one is the central fringe, that if all three of these rays travel roughly straight, then you're going, they're all going to add up constructively. Now, if we look at the separation, the, so the path length difference between the first ray and the second ray, this is, uh, this is still d sine theta, but then this difference between the first ray and the second, and the third ray is twice d sine theta. When we're looking at a central maximum, those still add up constructively, so we will still get constructive interference at the same maximum. But when we are looking at, um, at if we were looking at the minimum between these two rays, we would see that, uh, that there is an additional so it doesn't quite go to zero there. So if you're looking at the um, where what would happen in between the two maxima, you can actually get secondary fringes because you need to go somewhere between. Um, you need these wavelengths to you get extra minima because there will be different angles in between where the waves exactly cancel out. So what you see is that as you add, when you go from two slits to three slits, you add an extra small maximum, um, but you still keep the main three slits, but they get just a little bit narrower because the, the constructive interference is a little bit stronger. And then you add four slits, 
you'll see another sub-maximum. And these slits get narrower and narrower. And then you can add an, a much larger number of slits. See, you, it gets really hard to see these little sub-maxima, um, but you will continue to see the very strong maxima that were exactly the same maxima you would have with two slits. All right, then we can talk about thin films. Now, when you have, so you, you've seen this because you've already undoubtedly seen the sheen when you look at, a, when there's a little bit of oil or gasoline in a puddle or the sheen on top of bubbles where you can even see sometimes slight rainbows, uh, you see different colors. So we've already talked about refraction that when you have light incident, the light is uh, on some material with a different index of refraction, the incident light is bent by the, by the material because the speed of light is slower in a material that has a, um, that has a higher index of refraction. But what happens when you have light incident on some material where there is an index of refraction is that is different is that some of the light is reflected and some of it is in fact transmitted. And we talked about how this reflected light is, uh, is polarized and so then you can, wear, uh, you can wear polarized sunglasses that will preferentially block the reflected light. But when you have a very thin film, then where the, the thickness of the film, the film is on the order of meaning roughly the same size as uh, the, uh, the wavelength of light, then, so now I have a thin film, for instance, a soap bubble has air, soap, and, well, a soap and water layer, and then another air layer. So when it hits the first, um, when it hits the first interface, some of the light will reflect, when it travels on and it hits the second interface, some of the light will reflect. Now, some of it will be transmitted. We're not worried about that just yet, uh, or we're not going to consider that. But now you have two rays, which are both originally from the same source, so they are, in fact, coherent because they come from the same source. They are bouncing up and hitting. That is what you see with your eye. That's, that light will hit your eye. And you can get interference because of the effective path length difference between these two rays. So we want to look at what happens when you get constructive interference off of the, off of the thin film. So, ah, so here also when you have reflection, the, um, when you have reflection where the index of refraction is, uh, is greater so this has a higher um, index of refraction than that, then this um, wave picks up a phase shift of pi radians. So the, the phase of the reflected wave is different from the phase of the incident wave. Um, when you travel to this surface, and this is, if this is the soap bubble, when you hit here, the index of refraction is greater here than there, there is no phase shift from the wave. Another factor to consider is that when you are, um, when you are traveling in this medium, the wavelength, the speed of light is different. So the number of wavelengths that this, uh, that this wave sees is different. Um, so here you can see, well, these, these pictures didn't turn out so great. Um, but when you have uh, when you have two layers of, for instance, glass or any other surface you can see through um, close together, you will you can get thin film interference there, um, and you can also you can see this, for instance, if you illuminate it. All right, and here you have two convex lenses that are placed right next to each other. So again, the, len the lens is thin, so you can get, uh, you, can get uh, um, you can get interference between them there. All right, and I wanna go back to here. So what we can look at is when you get D 
destructive interference. Um, so if this distance is an integer number of wavelengths where the light travels to the, through the film and then bounces back, um, we are going to call this distance T. And then when, so that the total distance traveled by the light is 2T. When that is equal to uh, an integer number of wavelengths, then that, that is when we get destructive interference. Um, and the reason we get, ah, the reason we get, uh, note this is a different equation for uh, if, so if you have higher index of refraction, or sorry, lower index of refraction, higher index of refraction, lower index of refraction, so then you get an extra phase shift. So the, um, when this is equal to some integer times the number of wavelengths in the, um, in the medium, so the number of the wavelength in the medium is the wavelength divided by the index of refraction, then you would get destructive interference because this wave is exactly out of phase by, uh, by pi. You would then get constructive interference when this is a uh, half number uh, of wavelengths. So, For instance, here, if we set m equals 0, the first one occurs where you have half a wavelength here because then the two waves that started out out of phase are, end up in phase again. Um, and then when you add, when you go to m equals 2, you have added another whole wavelength. Um, so this is for constructive interference. And this is if N2 is greater than N1. Note that if you had, uh, if this wavelength, this index of refraction were higher than that index of refraction, you would not get that phase shift. And the same equation would give you destructive interference. OK, now we're going to talk about the Michelson interferometer. And this is going to come up again when you get to talking about modern physics. So uh, let me just tell you to keep it in your head somewhere so that you, um, because you will revisit it. All right, so um, here you can see some schematics of, uh, um, of a Michelson interferometer. And I think I'm actually going to draw it to, from the top view as well. So here you have some incoming laser ray, and then you have a beam splitter. Um, when you have a, let me actually draw the beam, the optics in a different color, just because they're easier to see. Um, so you have a beam splitter, and what that does is that roughly half of the light is going to go in this direction, and roughly half of the light is going to go forward. So this is something where we talked about how when you reflect off of a surface, you don't reflect 100%, you reflect some of the light, not 100% of the light. So here, the light is partially transmitted and partially reflected. And the beam splitters are chosen so that roughly half of the light goes in this direction and roughly half of the light goes in that direction. And then we travel along and um, we will put a mirror here. Uh, I was going to change the colors. We're going to put a mirror here and a mirror here so that now I'm going to draw two beams. We get some of the light, we, we get the light reflected here and we get light reflected here. And the light that is reflected here 
a significant amount of it will reflect in this direction as well. So that we have the two laser beams from the same source. Um, where the light that gets transmitted here is just going to go back towards the source, and usually it it's it doesn't really impact the source too much. Um, and then you would also get some light pointing here that would get reflected. We won't worry about that. Um, so you have uh, light you have light reaching your detector, which travels one of two different paths. It is either, so this is a detector, this is a mirror, there's two mirrors, um, and this is a beam splitter. And then you have your detector. So the light travels either through one path or the other. Um, and the difference in the paths traveled is this versus that. So then um, we can measure very small distances. So why might you want to do this? Well, now we're going to consider slightly shifting this, um, this mirror. And as we do that, we're going to change the path length. So the path length, if this is, um, if we move this by a distance delta d, then the path length, the change in the path length seen by the laser beam is twice that to delta D because it has to travel there and back. And when we get constructive, inter we will get constructive interference when that, so let's say we started with these two beam, laser beams exactly in phase. So I might not know exactly what this length is and what that length is, but I can tweak the distance until I see that they are in phase. And then I'm going to shift just this guy. And then if I move this, if I see one whole wavelength pass, if the change in path length is equal to an integer number of wavelengths, I will see one um, if I will see one fringe go past so that I get um, I see that I, I can then know that I moved the this 2d was equal to one wavelength. Now what your book talks about is inserting a, um, inserting an object with a different index of refraction which you would like to measure. So specifically, if you look at example 3.6, you put an object in here, you put a cell that can contain gas in here, um, and initially you have it empty, you have it evacuated, so there's nothing in it, and then you slowly pump gas into it so that you can see the gas, so that you can see the fringes go by. When you put gas in it, you are changing the number of wavelengths because the index of refraction in the gas is different from the index of refraction in air. So you can count how many fringes go by, and that tells you how many wavelengths of light you added by, uh, by putting the, the gas in. And then you can use that to calculate the index of refraction of the gas. Um, I'll let you look at the example, but this is an a, this is an application of the Michelson Morley interferometer. When you see it in modern physics, you're going to see this again to look at path length differences in light. Um, in that case, what have what you do is that you look at it, you rotate the interferometer to see if you, there's any indication of the ether. And spoiler alert, they didn't find an ether. Um, but you could measure it very precisely. So this Michelson-Morley interferometer is incredibly good at measuring path length differences. It let people do these experiments before we were, you know, otherwise you would have to measure um, mechanical objects on the order of the wavelength of light, so hundreds of nanometers. We weren't good at that around the early 1900s, so they never would have been able to measure it without using very clever devices like this 
But what it lets you do, it, it isn't measuring the path length, it is measuring the path length difference because you're able to use the interference of light to see how things change. All right, and here you can see what it looks like on the screen. So here this is set up so that it's constructive interference. And you know, I can tell you from having done this many years ago as an undergraduate, it can be a little tricky to, to tell when you have a perfect maximum versus, okay, maybe you're at 80% of the amplitude, but um, you can see those fringes go by. Um, and what you see is that there's a central spot, but as you travel where the two laser beams are, are aligned, but then as you go off from that central spot, you actually see maxima and minima as they are interfering constructively and destructively. And when you change that path length, what you will see is that this this spot expands and then there's a dark hole that comes into it and then there's a new um, a new maximum that comes up in its spot. All right, and this is just the example where you put a gas in, you start with a vacuum in here and then you pump a gas into it and watch how many fringes go in. All right, so moving to some examples, um, I will say, I think you know this type of question tends to show up on uh, on exams um, as as well as on standardized tests. So here the question is, you know, here we have a double slit, a distance x away from the screen, um, where then you have some maximum. Uh, you have the distance from the center of the screen given by y. When the distance d between the slits is relatively large. Uh, numerous bright spots appear called fringes. Show that for small angles, um, the distance between the fringes is given by delta x equals, um, uh, that's a delta y equals m lambda over d. So that was using our, so we have the path length difference is d sine theta and this has got to be equal to m lambda. And now we're going to approximate this as d tan theta for small angles, which is d y over x. And then uh, we, as we go from one y to the other, uh, and I need this is equal to m lambda. So d y m over x, the m y is equal to m lambda, d y m plus 1 over x equals m plus 1 lambda, and then I'm going to subtract this from that, and I get d y m plus 1 minus y m over x equals m plus 1 lambda minus m lambda. And then here we have d over x delta y. I'm just going to call that difference delta y is equal to m lambda. So I'm going to multiply on top and bottom by x over d, and I get delta y equals, uh, sorry, this should be a 1, delta y equals x over d delta y, or sorry, x over d lambda. All right. 
two narrow slits are equally spaced 0.25 millimeters apart and illuminated with yellow light of, with a wavelength of 580 nanometers. What are the angular positions of the third and fourth principal maxima? That, and then what, are this, what is the separation of these maxima on a screen two meters from the slits? Okay, so as I read this, 10 narrow slits, equally spaced, 0.25 millimeters. So I'm going to write this as 2.5 times 10 to the negative 4 meters. And that is our separation between the slits D. Our wavelength is 580 nanometers, which is 5.8 times 10 to the negative 7th meters. And then we need the third and fourth principal maxima, which are m's of 3 and 4. Um, so we start with d sine theta equals m lambda or sine theta equals m lambda over d, and this is m times 5.8 times 10 to the negative 7th meters over 2.5 times 10 to the negative 4th meters. All right, so then we have to plug in a three. Uh, so this, this number works out to be m times 2.4 times 10 to the negative three. And we can actually check that by uh, without plugging the numbers into our calculator. So here, 10 to the negative 7 divided by 10 to the negative 4 is 10 to the negative 3. And here we have roughly 6 by 2.5. So it's going to be a little bit more than 2. Um, and that is consistent with 2.4 times 10 to the negative 3. All right. Then to get the, ex and this is, we're not on me. Beautiful. So to get the exact numbers, I have to plug in the, uh, I have to take the inverse sign here. And what I get is 0. 0.415 radians and 9. Point, that's the wrong one. Ah, that is not correct. 0. 0.45 radians is too many. I have 7.25. Times 10 to the negative 3 radians and 9.67 times 10 to the negative 3 radians, or in degrees, this works out to be 0.415. degrees and 0.553 degrees. All right, and then when I want to calculate its position on the screen, let me go ahead and do this. If we do this 
without the small angle approximation, uh, I did it with the, let's see. I did it with the small angle approximation first, and I get 1.45 centimeters. Let me write this to a few more digits. 1.4500001 and One point nine three 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 four This is with the small angle approximation where what I have done is uh right what I've done is assumed that this is the uh, separation delta y over d. So I have just multiplied these numbers in radi these number, let's see, I've just multiplied this number times m by d. And then if I want to do the, uh, if I want to do the exact number, then I have to say this, so I get the angle and delta y is d tangent of the inverse sine of m lambda over D. All right, and I found a slight, I had a capital D there. It should be a lowercase d. This is the separation between the slits. This is the distance to the screen. And when I plug these in and I do not use the small angle approximation, then this one is 1.45 zero zero three eight two one point four five zero zero three eight two and this is one point nine three three four two three seven centimeters so you can see that our small angle approximation worked until we got to the 100 thousandths place. That's where we started seeing a discrepancy. And here it was the 10 thousandths place. But it's only a slight discrepancy. All right, and then in this one, in a Michelson interferometer, the light of a wavelength of 632 nanometers, 632.8 nanometers from a helium neon laser is used. When one of the mirrors is moved by a distance d, eight fringes move past the field of view. What is the value of the distance d? All right, this one's, okay, so here we're gonna start just like in the, in the past semester, we start by writing down what we know. All right, when the wavelength, so the wavelength is 632.8 nanometers. I'm just gonna go ahead and, calc and convert it to meters right away. Um, and eight fringes move past the field of view. When eight fringes move past the field of view, we have moved eight wavelengths. So you have eight lambda is equal to the change in path length, but 
the light travels twice the length, so the change in path length is 2d. So what is the distance it has traveled that it has traveled? D? D equals 4 lambda. And that concludes the chapter on interference. I hope you found it constructive.